أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد رب الشحي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحد العقدة الميساني يبقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, welcome everyone to the second lecture of the RSI series, The Quantic Soul. Um, sorry for the late delay, um, especially for, for boys um, in terms of the upload. Uh, we had some problems getting um, the recording uh, from last time, so I re-recorded it. So inshallah, it's good quality and I say the same things as I said them last time. But inshallah, um, if you guys can stay patient with us, uh, we can keep going. We thought of uh, to start again uh, with Dua Al-Fajr, as we said we do every single time, so that Imam Mahdi can bless us with his presence, so we can all read it together. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, Allahumma kulli waliyika al-hujjat ibn al-Hasan, salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai, في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So um, today we thought of we'd, we'd set off the lecture with a bit of a recap from lecture one, just so we can reinforce some of the um, concepts because we feel like we didn't explain them maybe properly last le- last time. So inshallah we can go through that. So we started off uh, the lecture by exploring Surah Al-Alaq and the meaning of the word Qra'a. Um, and we said that we were going to take it as um, seeing um, the Lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything around us. Um, then we moved on to, in the surah, um, talking about how um, we are dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. And like that, he, like he, yeah, so that's why we um, said we were alaq. That was what we described alaq as. And the final bit was when we talked about how... Um, we are uh, just a paper, and everything imprints on us like a pen. Um, so those are the three concepts that we talked about last time. And why we want to reiterate them is because these same three concepts are going to be sort of reoccurring throughout these muhabara, these le- this lecture series. So if you guys can keep like paying attention um, to these, so that if they do come up, you can remember that it's from Surah al Um We also talked about uh, what a soul was, and we feel like we may have accidentally sort of um, misled you there. Uh, when we talk about a soul, we don't mean spirit or an Arabic ruh. Um, that concept is different. That's the thing that Allah SWT gave us. You know, when he said, نَفَقْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي That's the, the spirit, not the soul. So when we talk about our souls, we're not talking about the spirit. It's a different thing. Um, we, we sort of said that soul was equal to self. It's the thing that, you know, we point to. The thing that we actually are rather than this physical body. So that's what we just want to highlight. Soul and self are the same thing. And we're not talking about that thing that Allah SWT gave it us from himself. Um, another point we wanted to, we brought up last time was in the hadith, Imam Ayah said we have four souls. The plantic soul, the animalistic soul, the divine intellectual soul, and the divine universal soul. So what we said was, um, we were going to, in, in the next lectures, like today, explore each of these souls further and see their purpose in us and how we, we are meant to use them. So inshallah, today we'll look at the plantic soul, the first of the four souls. And we described how the souls are together in our body, but they're not mixed. And we brought up the uh, video clip from Dragon Ball to um, highlight that. Uh, Vegeta and Goku, the two people, fused together, but you could still hear their voices distinctly. And what that was meant to show is that although all our souls are together in one body, they still can show themselves at the same time. Like, it's not like a a situation where one of them appears, then has to swap out for another one. No, no, all four of them can show themselves at the same time. So that's enough for the recap. And inshallah, we'll move on to um, the hadith. So the section of the hadith that talks about the plantic soul is this one. فَالنَّامِ النَّبَاتِيَ The plantic soul, لَهَا خَمْسْ قِوَى Has five tools. مَاسِكَ وَجَادِبَ وَحَاظِمَ 
wadafi'a wa murabbiya. So the puller, or the grasper, the puller, the digester, the pusher, and the nurturer. Walaha khasiyatan has two characteristics. As ziyada wa naqsan, increase and decrease. Wa bi'adha min al-kabad, and its origin is from the liver. So what we want to highlight, like focus on today, uh, before we get into um, divulging to the specifics of the planting soul, is the difference between the word qiwa, which I translate the tools, and then khasiyatan, characteristics. What's the actual difference between the two and how do they play, you know, together in, in, in the soul? And so to give you a further example of how we can look at this, we'll um, imagine a robot. And let's say this is no ordinary robot, it's a smart robot, that's specifically a pancake making robot. So its job is that it makes pancakes. However, obviously right now, it really doesn't have the capability to make pancakes. It doesn't have the utensils or the, the uh, like, you know, the, the, the equipment to make it. So then it needs, like, you know, a spatula to beat the, the batter and then a frying pan to actually fry the pancakes so that it can make the pancakes. So it needs these tools to allow it to fulfill its job. And so that's the really the difference between characteristics and tools. The characteristics are more like, you know, its job or what it's named as or what it, what it like, you know, its function is. Whereas the tools are things it uses to help it achieve its characteristic or to help it fulfill its job. So that was something we want to highlight before we divulge into um, the characteristics and the tools of the plantic soul. So in terms of the hadith, it says the characteristics of the plantic soul were two, and they were increase and decrease. And since these concepts, like they seem quite basic and simple, but they're actually quite fundamental to our development. Obviously, as a baby, you know, we need to grow in our mother's tummy. So we need this increase factor quite early on. And that's why we sort of come pre-installed with the plantic cell. It's sort of like a cell we get as soon as we were conceived in, 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 our, in our mother. As soon as conception occurs, we get the cell. And since we use it, then uh, the first cell that we are, you know, we start off as a cell, and then we start dividing. That straight away starts the increase process. And so just a side note here is that um, the plantic cell comes as soon as we're conceived, because it's super important. Um, so, but... Let's sort of understand what increase and decrease are. Like they seem like sort of quite you know overarching concepts. Well, let's start with a microscopic level, or like or analysis on the micro scale, and we can see this in ourselves really easily. The process of mitosis. It's when two cells divide um, to form new cells, and it's how we rejuvenate, how we heal, how we grow in our body. All these things are increase, examples of increase. Same thing with a baby. When it starts off as a little embryo and grows up to be a, a large child, you know, as we see children are born, from one cell to that, that's just an increase of cells. So all of like our cellular processes of rejuvenation, of growth, they're all increase. And it's quite beautiful to see how Allah SWT has created this intricate system of increase. But what about decrease? Like it's pretty easy to, you know, see increase. Um, but why is, like, we, we can't see the benefit of decrease a lot of the time. Like, what's so important about having this decrease in our lives? And to give you an example on the cellular level as well, on a as, as cellular level as well, so we can compare increase and decrease, it'd be apoptosis. Uh, apoptosis is a process in our body, which literally means programmed cell death. So it's when our cells are told, like, given a signal to kill themselves, and they do. But why is that even important? Well, we'll show you. First of all, if you didn't know this, a baby, when they're in the mother's tummy and developing, we're actually born with like webbed fingers. We don't actually have fingers yet. And only through apoptosis are those cells in between, like the web bits, um, killed off so that we do have, you know, limbs when we're born. So apoptosis is really important in our formation. But at the same time, it's also important just every day. Whenever our cells detect a problem with our DNA or a problem with replication, the cell is told to kill itself off before it starts replicating the bad stuff and causing problems. A really good example of this is cancer. Cancer is when we can't, we don't have this apoptosis and the bad DNA keeps replicating and so it becomes a problem in our body. And you know how deadly cancer is, it's, it's lethal. So we can see how important the decrease is Decrease is required to balance the increase and, you know, keep that balance up because we can't keep, keep growing because eventually, you know, we work in our houses. We need that level of decrease 
that helps, you know, remove unwanted things to make space for growth. So we just wanted to introduce this concept of how both increase and decrease are super important. And that's the characteristics of plant itself. But let's move on to a more macro level. We talked about like, you know, the minute, the cells, but what about on a larger scale? Well, you know, our growth is really like, you know, and our aging from a baby to an older person to an adult. That growth and age is, you know, a you know, bigger example seeing like, on the micro scale, we saw how um, mitosis, you know, causes this growth. But when you look at someone, they grow taller, that's on a, like, a greater scale. That growth is also the plantic cell. And the decreased kind of part to that is wilting. We don't really see it in humans, even though it does happen. Um, like, um, we men, um, we, our peak vitality is 47. Then we just go downhill from there. Same thing with women, it's, but it's at age 35, so younger. But we can really see it in plants. In plants, we can see how wilting is really important. Like, we can see it in a flower. How a flower starts off as upright, then slowly uh, uh, droops, and then dies off. But why is that important at all? Like, it's really hard to understand why we'd really need this um, decrease. And so if we look at a flower's cycle, or a plant's cycle of life, we can really see it. So it's actually from something small and increase, increase, until it gets to a flower. But only after it wilts can fruit be uh, like can the tree bear fruit. Fruit stems from wh uh, where the, the 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 wilted flower was. So therefore, we can see how wilting is important because it means that something can go, so something can take its place. Same how we talked about on the micro scale, cells uh, need to die so other new cells can replace them. Um, also, the flowers when they wilt, they become the nutrients for the tree later on. So wilting is a process whereby we can um, renew the next generation. And that's an important concept because increasing number, like as in having kids, is also a form of increase that the plantic soul deals with. Like that's why we're talking about the development of the baby. And so wilting is what sort of like facilitates that entry or gives that um, and uh, gives the new life sort of that, that, that substantial uh, backing. And that's the importance of wilting. Um, so if you sort of look at life, look at the plant specifically, we sort of see things start off from nothing, they grow, and they go down again. And we sort of see this like arc-like movement, like a wave. We can see the same thing with humans. We also follow that path, we start from nothing, we end from nothing. And we want to introduce this concept to something like that happens in everything we do. Our last month has created like a cyclical part to our system. Everything in the universe has this. You can, you guys can think of many examples of this, but if we look at it, um, why, why Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala created this system? We can see this when we explore, um, uh, explore uh, the. Uh, we we say this a lot. I'm sorry, we say this a lot. Inna Allah wa ilayhi rajiun. We don't really understand what that means. Like obviously, yeah, we we came from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We're gonna go back to him, but Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has given us sort of like. The pl uh, a clock in this life, something that limits our time in this test so that we can go back to him and submit our responses. And that's the plantic soul. The plantic soul allows us to have this way of like existence, to grow and then decrease so that we can, you know, start in this world, develop in this world, and then go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, submit our exam papers. And that shows you the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala system. Everything in the universe starts from him and ends to him. Starts in the test and it ends the test with him. And it's a really beautiful concept to see. Um, and it really does show our dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To, to really clarify what I mean here, um, we can give an example of an ocean. And when I give this example, I'm not limiting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to anything. I'm going to compare to him to the ocean, but I'm not directly comparing him to it. It's just to understand the concept. Um, if let's say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the ocean, what are waves? Waves are things that come and then go back into the ocean. They, they appear, they grow, then they go back down to the ocean, become part of it. The wa all the wave is, is part of the ocean. The water the, that makes up the wave is the ocean itself. And then that water grows into something, has a bit of energy, and then goes back into the ocean as if it didn't exist. And that's like us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this life from himself. He gave us the ruh, not, not the soul, the, the ruh at the moment. He gave us the, 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 the soul as well, but it, from him, he gave us the ruh. We are, he, we are he, him, like he is everything. And so what we're trying to say here is that he gave us this life and we go back to him, just like a wave. 
and we wanted to just introduce this concept, showing how dependent we are on him. Without the ocean, the wave couldn't exist. And that's what we mean in Surah Al-Alaq, when we say we are Alaq. We are something that's almost like definitely guaranteed dependent on Allah Taala, because we can't exist without him. So that's the characteristics. Let's move on to the tools now. So in the hadith, uh, the Imam A.S. talks about five tools. We'll talk about four of them at the moment. But remember when we talked about the robot, we said that what the, the purpose of tools are, are to aid us in our characteristic, aid us in achieving our characteristic. So if we say our characteristic is, you know, growth, increase and decrease, what do we even need to grow? Fortunately, since I don't have an audience today, I have to tell you guys the answer. But yeah, it's eating, food. We need food to survive. We need food to grow. And so all our tools are things that help us to do this growth. The masike that Imam Ali says is the mouth. It grasps the food and holds on to the food. Similarly, jadiba is the esophagus, our pipe that pulls down the food into the digestive system. I know it theoretically, you know, pushes the food down, but if we're talking in terms of the digestive system, it pulls it towards the center. Then we have the halima, the stomach, which digests the food using all the acids and, and um, enzymes in the stomach acid. Um, those help digest the food down. Then we have a dafia, which can be seen through the small intestine and large intestine. The small intestine um, pushes um, the nutrients out of the digestive system. And then uh, the large intestine pushes the feces or the, the remainder outside of our body. So that's the four, um, four of the five things that Imahani talks about. And they're all related to eating. Have you ever heard the saying, you are what you eat? It's sort of true here. Why we're trying to say that the tools aid the characteristics is that we know that what we eat pretty much makes up what we are. I know a lot of people these days are trying to refute the statement going, don't worry, especially like in the, in the movements to make people feel better about how they look. It's really, it's, it's nice, but it's not exactly true. Um, they're trying to say that, oh, if you eat a burger, you're not the burger, that's not part of you. Well, yeah, it is. We look at it realistically. When we eat a piece of steak, you know, it goes into our digestive system, and we break it down into its components, the amino acids. And what does our body do with the amino acids after we push it into our body and deliver it to our cells? Those amino acids eventually make up our muscles, our um, membrane proteins, which are pretty much um, like the guards in our cells. They let things go in and out. And even translation. Translation, by the way, is a very important process if you haven't done it in biology already. But what it is, is the way our DNA actually instructs our body to do anything. We use proteins to give those instructions from the DNA to the cell or to the parts of the cell. So everything we're made up of, how we look like, our hair color, that's all determined by what we eat, by our proteins, or what our mothers ate as well when we were in her stomach. So it really is key having these tools to aid our characteristics. So now that we've established that we are what we eat, let's think of a bit more of a Islamic concept, and it's really important. What happens if we eat haram food, even by accident? We can sort of like, you know, think about this a lot. But what is, what, like, we haven't really seen, like, we haven't really thought about the impact. You know, if it's by accident, we don't get a sin, so it's okay. We just move on, we move on. But does it leave an actual impact? Well, if you go, like, to a doctor, they'll obviously tell you, you're physically fine. If you go up, like, to a doctor, your GP, um, and you're like, oh, I ate uh, pork, I'm going to die, and everything like that, he'll examine you and say, there's nothing wrong with you. It's true that, that that pork has now, you know, made up some of your physical form, so that, that is a bad bit. But what is the real impact of eating this haram food? And it is that it affects our form in the hereafter. What we mean by this um, can be really explored if we see the point of the planting soul in this life. In this dunya, our body is like our vehicle. It really is. We and like we remember we said we're we're our, us the cell. We're inside this body. This body is not us. It's just like a tool that we use a a car to move around and do action in this world, to interact with this world. It's literally our vehicle. Physical food is like the fuel to the car, not to us, the car. So it's what the car consumes to make it, you know, run. The LPG, like, or like, you know, the gas station is our planting soul. It's the thing that facilitates our, like, uh, consumption of food. 
It's what allows us to eat the food. Makes sense, right? But what about the food of our hereafter? More, like more. We said that our body is made up of what it, uh, what it consumes. What does our hereafter form consume to form itself? And the answer to that is our actions. Our actions are the food for our hereafter form and what help form it. So pretty much in the hereafter, our form is going to be made up of all these actions which go into it and eventually, you know, create what it looks like. So we do do bad actions or we eat haram food. We may not get a sin, but that's going to form how our hereafter form looks like. Sin is even worse, obviously. And it can make us look like something from our nightmares, something hideous, horrendous, animal-like even, lower than animal, a monster. Because our actions, the reality of our actions, could be just this bad. Our hereafter form is formed from the reality of what we do in this dunya. So we could look disgusting. That's sort of like a negative note. On a positive note, the same thing can be said. If we do good actions, we can look majestic, beautiful, things from our wildest dreams. And so this sort of um, gives us sort of a more insight into why Shuhada are so happy and brave and willing to die. I always thought, how? How do they have this bravery? Where do they muster this yaqeen from? And it's really quite nice. They muster it because they know that the action that they're going to uh, partake in, the, willing, the, 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 the action of, of, you know, sacrificing yourself for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of the greatest actions possible and will make you, your hair after form look like a knight, something beautiful and amazing. And so that's really what we have to look at next time, every time we do our actions. Think, what's the reality of this action and how will it impact my hair after the body? So um, eating haram food has more than just an impact of making up our physical body. It has an effect on our yaqeen and our hair after form. So next time, you know, when we're in the, in, the, in the stores, let's not hesitate to read the ingredients of something. A lot of the time, you know, we, we're not bothered. Maybe not with lollies packaged specifically. When we go to restaurants, there's no direct ingredients list. So it's a hassle to go have, having to go to the uh, shop owner and ask them or like the, the person at the cashier and be like, give me the ingredients. If they don't know it, they ask the boss. It gets tiring, I know. But isn't it worth it? Just in case, even if something doesn't look like it has um, any um, haram ingredients, it could. Like this, by the way, this chocolate cake, I, I found it when searching for um, alcohol-based um, cakes. It's a red wine cake, by the way. It doesn't look it, it looks delicious. But that's really not what the, the reality of it. Because the reality of alcohol we know is fire, literal fire. That's what the Ahl Bayt say, that the reality of alcohol is fire. So by consuming this cake, we're literally consuming fire. Our hair off the form is suffering. So let us please be careful. Please increase our yaqeen and make sure we check every single time. Okay, so that was the first four of um, our tools. There was one more, and it was murabiya, the nurturer. Why we didn't have it with the first four is it sort of like it takes a different tangent, a different track, and it's, to, it's more to help another form of increase. We said increase is growth, right? But it also, I, I, I said it after when talking about uh, the wilting uh, process, it's also increasing number, having children. The murabiya is that ability for a mother to, you know, have a child, for the womb to be able to sustain a child, give it its nutrients, give it the warmth it requires. That is what the nurturer provides. It provides that capacity for us to procreate. It also, if, uh, us guys, yeah, we don't have a womb, we can't have children. Oh, oh, is our nurturing part of us useless? No, 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 no. Even the maternal and paternal instincts when the child is born to take care of them are also part of the murabiya. Even if your instinct is to not, if you don't know, go on Google and search up how to take care of your child in the best way, that's still that instinct, that drive, is part of this. Um, it's really a quite nice little gift Allah Ta'ala has given us in our, in our plantic soul, which is in charge of our growth. He's given us a gift that allows us to even have this beautiful relationship with our children, which is amazing. The last bit of the uh, hadith um, was the origin, and it said, in bi'atah min al-kabad, so that it originates from the liver. We can take this to mean the physical liver, that's okay, but there are uh, different professorin, like different translators, have, have looked at it different ways. 
uh, one translation was um, directly that, yeah, it's the liver. Another one was just the things inside of us. Maybe they mean by, by that all the organs, which sort of makes sense. We need all our organs to even grow, right? So that and survive. And that's the, what the Pontic Solary does with increase and decrease. And so that would make sense. Another one was, if you look at um, Surat al-Balad, Allah SWT says, And their kebed was talking about the dunya, because it meant struggle. And so in, in, the, in the ayah, it was talking about this world. And that makes sense. We did say that as soon as we're conceived, we get this Pontic soul. So it could be that, that's what it could be talking about. The origin is, as soon as we come into this world, where the Pontic soul originates. So that also makes sense. But let's see if... Like, it's not really important to dwell on the origin. But let's see, if we were going to take it in the literal meaning, to mean liver, why, why is the liver so important to maybe have this, like, place of origin? Well, it's sort of developed quite early on. Three to four weeks out of the 40 weeks of the child's, like, um, time in the womb. So in, in the third or fourth week, the liver forms. So it's quite early on. And why that is, is because it's quite important in terms of function. Our liver helps, uh, it stores all the iron that we need in our hemoglobin, which is the thing that allows our red blood cells to carry oxygen to our body. Without it, we'd die. It also holds a lot of the um, enzymes and stuff, forms them and, and, and sends them to the body, which help in different things like digestion, things like that. Which, you know, we said digestion, eating, growth, also important. And the last thing is, it purifies our blood. It's like a filtration system. Without it, we'd also die. So it's sort of a detox method, which helps, you know, determine our, our time in this life. So also, you know, it sort of makes sense why it would be really strongly linked with the plantic soul. So that's just a bit about the origin. So now that we've explored what the plantic soul is, why have we been given it? What's the purpose of a plantic soul? To sort of understand the exact purpose of the plantic soul, I guess we should look at look at what the plantic soul by itself would be without all our other souls. So here we can pose the question, is there an organism at all with only the plantic soul? Can we even survive with only the plantic soul? And the answer is given sort of in the name, like a hint. Yeah, plants only have a plantic soul. So if we understand the purpose of plant in this world, we can sort of understand the role of the plantic soul within us. So what is the purpose of a plant? Well, realistically, all it does is it grows and reproduces and grows and reproduces. It's fruit and flowers all part to attract the um, animals to help it reproduce. And all the, its roots uh, gather nutrients, all the water it requires is for its growth and survival. So that's really it. But did a lot of spontaneous animals really just create plants for them you know, just to exist, just grow, survive? Let us eat them, and that's it. Like, is it re is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? It wouldn't be that cruel. He'd never create something just to be, you know, useless. Obviously, there's a, there's a purpose for plants, and a purpose not only ben that benefits us, but them as well. And so, there's a really um, uh, if, to understand this, we can look at the Quran, which always has the answers to all our questions. Um, in the Quran, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "Allahu Akbar." Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In Surah 16, هو الذي أنزل من السماء ماء لكم منه شراب ومنه شجر فيه تسيمون ينبت لكم به الزرع والزيتون والنخيل والعناب ومن كل الثمرات إن في ذلك لآية لقوم يتفكرون. The bit in this um uh, in this surah that I want to focus on is the fact that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says ينبت لكم. He calls to go for you. Talking to the human being. Allah SWT is directly telling us that He created plants for us, to serve us or to be useful to us. Also, in the previous ayah, it says for us to be able to pasture our animals. So, also for animals, for us to, you know, um, for our animals as well. So, that brings up two points. The first is that it looks like a plant's role is to be like uh, sacrificed or to be used by animals and plants. Uh, animals and humans, sorry. Plants to be used by animals and humans. And animals to be used by humans too, because that's what, that's what it's sort of implying with the, the, the pasturing part. Pasturing your animals. So here we want to introduce a concept called the chain of ascension. The concept of ascension. So Allah has created a beautiful system whereby plants are sort of like that bottom line. 
matter is obviously below because it, it's a non-living thing. But plants are like the bottom line because they only have one soul. Then come animals with two souls, the plantic and animalistic soul, who are higher up in this chain. And finally humans, which are the, um, the, the top of this chain. What happens is plants can uh, bypass animals, go straight to humans. But what they want to do, they want to ascend in an existence, ascend in their like level of existence, so they can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what he like that's what he created in his system. For them to be able to fulfill their purpose, they want to be closer to him by becoming a higher existence. So that's why they want to serve animals and humans so they can ascend to their level. Similarly, animals want to ascend to the human level. And if you think, oh, we're humans, we're top, the top of the tier by the looks of it, so we don't have to do any work. No, there is a level above it, and it's to be a perfect human. We'll explain that in later lectures. But this sort of chain is re really sort of looks similar to something we see at school. The food chain. We see that plants are always the producers, the basis. And they give to animals and humans, and, and then humans also eat animals too. So it really, it's a really beautiful similar to what has made. We always thought, oh, you know, animals and human, uh, plants are just... You know, used for we use them because you know Allah made them and that we can use them. But what's beautiful is Allah Taala has made it their job as well to serve us, which is really quite nice. But what does it mean to serve us? To look at it further, we'll see how the three different ways that a plant can actually ascend in this world. The first one is to be consumed by animals, because as we said before, you are what you eat. If a plant is eaten by an animal, it becomes part of the animal, and so it's ascended in existence. To be consumed by humans is another thing too. We eat them, they become part of us. And by the way, when we talk about consumption, it isn't just about eating. It could be anything. For example, we don't eat cotton, but we use it for our clothes. It's consumed by us as a resource. So that also counts. Wood too. So that's what we're trying to say. Consumed means become useful to us. But the final method is sort of different to the first two. It's to evolve, like to form more animal-like characteristics. We can see this in um, Venus flytraps or those pot bellies. They've even developed sort of like a sensory system, something they don't have. Only animals are meant to have that. that that's, that's something we're going to talk about next lecture. It's something that is specific to the animalistic soul, the sensory sort of stimulation. So to develop animal-like characteristics is a way for them to obviously ascend because they're trying to be more like a higher existence. So that's the three ways a plant can ascend. But to actually serve us and, you know, to, to um, give itself up to us, obviously it needs to grow, reproduce, so that our generations can have plants further on. And so all it needs is this plantic soul to grow, reproduce, survive until it can be useful to us. So it can grow into a form, like to form fruit, that's useful to human beings to be able to be consumed. So that's why when we look at people like, you know, vegans or people that waste food, you sort of like, they sort of, being cruel or mean to animals and plants because they're not allowing them to ascend and fulfill their purpose. Vegans I think I think that they're being kind to animals um, by not eating them. Oh, we, by the way, are not condoning the maltreatment of the farm industry to animals and, and treating them in a horrific manner. That's not, we're, we're not condoning that at all. We're in fact condemning that. But we're saying the act of not eating animals isn't allowing them to fulfill their purpose. Each animal has a purpose. Some of them is to be eaten and consumed by us. And so we shouldn't, you know, refrain from consuming meat because we think it's good for them. Because eating them is what's good for them. Similarly with wasting food. When we waste food, we see the, the fast food industry does it quite a lot. When we waste food, we're actually not letting the, 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 the animals and plants that make up the food ascend. And that's really sad. And that's why it's a big no-no in Islam to waste food. So that was just a little concept we wanted to introduce. And it sort of shows the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's system. Because what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done is He allowed us, even through eating animals, to, even through, you know, consuming animals, they're allowed to ascend. It's a really beautiful and merciful system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we want to highlight. So to just in summary, a plant's purpose is to become the food for higher beings. It needs to sustain itself and create the energy which will sustain the other animals. And it needs to proliferate to continually sustain us. So all it needs is this increase and to be able to consume, to increase and decrease, and, you know, uh, to decrease in terms of flowers, to give fruit for us to consume. It only needs the plant itself, and that's why it only has it. 
But we obviously have a greater purpose. That's why we're higher on the, the ascension chain. And so that's why we need more than just the planet. So for us, yes, it's important. It helps us grow and survive in this world so we are able to take the test that Allah has given us to fulfill our purpose. And that's why we have it. We have it so we can, like, we have it so we can, um, you know, feed the vehicle of our world, the body, and survive so we can take the test that Allah has given us. So that's why we have a Pontic soul. But that's also why we don't only have a Pontic soul, because we have a greater purpose. And we'll discuss our purpose as we develop into each of the souls in future lectures. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Sorry, just before we end here, um, the video segment of the lecture, um, I won't be able to show you now. Um, so the clip that we look at before we want to do the quiz for the Pontic Soul um, is from Lion King. It's when Mufasa talks to Simba about the circle of life. So if you want, go on the internet, search it up. And if you want to do the quiz and you haven't done so already, uh, what I suggest you do is email me and I'll send you the link to the quiz. My email is in the first lecture, so if you were there, um, if, it's there. If not, it's Alan Sari I, so A L A N S A R I I two one five seven at gmail dot com. So two eyes. Okay, so inshallah, see you soon in our coming lectures, inshallah, and hopefully we'll do have some more live ones. Salam alaikum, Muhammad, wa